Hey guys, real quick before we get into the video, I just want to introduce one new segment that I'm going to be doing in every single video and that is at the end of the video, I'm going to pick one lucky person and their question that they've asked in the comments and I'm going to answer it. So don't forget to leave any questions that you may have about beekeeping, about your hives, and maybe you'll be the lucky person to get your answer. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm out here today with Casey, Caleb, and Ron. We're out at one of their bee yards, one of their honey yards. Um, they're really big into pollination and we're prepping the hives for some melons coming up really soon. So let's see what he's got going on. I might have to borrow a high but anyways, if you think about it, oh, a lot of good ways, thank you, a lot yeah. of ways to transmit diseases is by crushed, crushed bees when the gut gets broke open and stuff like yeah. that. It's a good way for those trans, uh, diseases to get transmitted. So that's why I think it's important to use smoke, smoke them, get them out of the hmm. way. And just a little tip. <laughs> Um, you use the same thing for your smoke, right? Mm hmm Like, when I did smoke my bees, I learned, like, a lot of people like, just grab what's on the ground and throw it in there. Like, I have a collection of leaves that I only use because it almost acts as, like, a pheromone for you. Like, bees remember your face. So yes. when you walk up and you spray them with smoke, if it smells like leaves one day, but it smells like this plant the next day, and it smells like this plant the next day, they don't know who you are. And they don't learn mm -hmm. what you're there for. You're like a new intruder every time. <laughs> So, so I'm a big advocate of that. What I figure is, uh, I like using the wood pellets or bedding pellets. Also, mm. same thing almost. But uh, I ran out of those a week ago. So uh, the second yeah. best thing which Ron uses is pine needles. Pine needles. Pine needles. I oh, I used to always use those. Pine. I love them. So. Pine. All right, so we're judging hives today for melons. And also getting ready to pull some honey before we put them in melons because Ideally, we want them double deep going in. But here's one of my yards. This one did fairly good this year. We got about half a box, oh, almost a box of honey, as you can see. So this one did pretty good, this hive. It's probably one of my better honey producing hives. This is a full box of honey. Oh. <laughs> Got here's an, got some brood up here maybe yeah here's oh. an here's another box of honey uh, this one that this one made so they've made about three boxes so i noticed you don't use queen excluders no queen excluders keeps the honey out of it keeps that sometimes super. sometimes it can restrict the honey mm -hmm. so i mean i call them a honey excluder. yeah honey excluder <laughs> it, it's really beekeeper's preference. You know, I have time. I don't run a ton of hives where I have to, you know, I'm not on a huge schedule, but what we're doing today is we're looking for size of the colony. Okay. I always guarantee at least a box of bees in my melons. California accept, accepts six frames of bees, yeah. eight frames. Eight frames preferred. Eight frames preferred, you know, six to eight frames. So I always, Try the average a box or more. Ideally, a more than a box. Mm -hmm. oh. So let me roll this colony. Oh, pretty. You want me to put her downstairs? No. Roll this colony. We got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven frames of bees. So about the whole box is full of bees. Plus, we got a whole top box here full of bees and honey super. So clearly, this hive is more than a box of bees. <laughs> so this one will definitely be going through melon and definitely will be doing my friends who are the melon farmers a good pollination service. What I'm gonna do, Caleb? I'm gonna put her in the front door. Okay. She won't come up in that brood anymore. So now why are you doing that? Yeah. She'll go in. Track uh -oh. star. Just so that she's not the uh, ideal. in that bottom box? Huh? Just so that she's in that bottom box? Yep. Okay. 
Okay. Also, what I'm doing is I'm going through hives. Uh, this make sure they're cleaned right. So we have a frame of pollen and uh, looks like nectar. It's a pretty warm day out, so they're on a nectar flow today. Shake it. Let's see how good. No, no. You look. See, there's the nectar in there. Yeah, you see all that? Flow today. Nice no, we're on a flow. You wouldn't have a shake like that if it was cooler. Okay, so we're looking for its eggs. That's how I tell if the colony's cleaned right. Uh, it's not, I have, I've gotten to the point where it's not worth um, looking for the queen anymore. It's more if you have eggs because they're in the, it's in the egg stage for all oh, three days roughly. So if you see eggs, most likely there's a queen. Mm -hmm. So in here, I don't know if you can tell, you might not be able to pick it up on camera, but I see eggs down in there. Looks like looks like a pretty good pattern, so we'll keep her, we won't requeen her. And so do you guys grade your queens based off of the egg laying pattern now then? Yeah. Versus the actual cap brood? Yeah, I'll look for uh I'll look at the cap brood and I'll see what that looks like. If it's spotty then I'll I'll pinch her off. Yeah. You know. Let me see if I can find a if you look this Here's some brood right here that's been emerging. And if you look, that's a pretty tight pattern right there. Now they're just back filling as they're emerging. So that tells me a couple weeks ago, you know, I haven't dug into the colony much more to see what it looks like, but that right there alone tells me she's got a good pattern. We'll let her go. Nice queen right there, made three boxes of honey. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Plus they have honey in the brood nest, so that's this is the ideal hive. Do you guys have a pretty good flow out here? Uh that's the secret to Michigan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michigan <laughs> with Michigan flows, it's a hit or miss some years. I mean some years you make I mean some years yeah. What was the lowest or minimum that you made, Ron, for uh, I think it's two pounds one year. Two pounds to the colony. Some with years my first my first year full time we did a over But that was 40. We were pre mites. Yeah, pre mites. Now, this, it's hard to say in Michigan. I average about a box a hive, roughly, in my hive. So, 28 pounds, roughly, to the colony, I think I average. But it's all, you know, this hive does well, that hive doesn't do well. You know, you don't know, don't know why. So, I'm going to look. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out real quick. <laughs> this will definitely be a good hive for me. Tina and Ed, if you're watching this, <laughs> this is the proof in the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> I pollinate for, I pollinate blueberries and apples and watermelons. And I have, do I have to say this, I've been thankful for all my pollination cust or customers. You know, I have, I pollinate for some of the best apple growers. I pollinate for a really good blueberry and my watermelon farmer friends, uh, they definitely gave me, when I was eight, 19, no 18, uh, unfortunately Ron's brother, Jim Dahlke, uh, he passed away in his sleep on, on a, you know, unknowingly. Sorry to hear that. And uh, so I, they live a couple miles from me and they were in need of a beekeeper. So I went to them and uh, they did, they, they let me pollinate their melons and it was, it was a big gamble for them, you know, a 19 year old and, you know, in charge of bringing in bees mm -hmm. to yeah. a contract that, uh, you know, they didn't know me at all at the time. Uh, they were just relying on a young kid and I'm definitely grateful for the opportunity they gave me. And yeah. Ooh, you that look at that. Beautiful. beautiful queen, but they didn't make much honey. So that's what I mean. They probably swarmed. Swarmed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed though that some queens they're just better with making honey than and some queens are just really good at making a ton of brood? Yeah. And then maybe it's like the genetics maybe playing a role or what do you think would be affecting you know, that? You know that's a I don't have all the answers but your this, question this one, there. This one probably swarm. Swarm. Oh get a video of that. Oh yeah. So people are wondering if they'll go to melons. Well just the bottom box is jam packed full of bees so it qualifies. It qualifies. Yeah. 
So, so why are you thinking that it swarmed based off of looking when you pulled it's the box? Way too, way too heavy. Way ah, too heavy. Yeah. They, okay. Or they went through a requeening process, yeah. which okay. could have happened. These went to blueberries. And uh, but to answer your question, why some don't make. Uh, Oh, yeah. Way too heavy. Yeah. All right. Way too heavy. But that's a good box of these right here. Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll probably come through and any wheat hive or hives that are light, I'll mm -hmm. cut that down a little bit honey-wise and feed it to them. Or pull a split off of that. Or even pull a split. But um, it's too yeah, funny. the reason why, I don't know why they just don't send honey upstairs. I think maybe it's just the time they requeen. You know, so I don't have the answer for that. Yeah. That's, I bet you, though, someone that with a higher degree than me. <laughs> yeah, probably. My high school diploma, probably. Higher pay grade. Yeah, higher pay grade. <laughs> That's all right. Just curious. Yeah, this one looks like it's doing pretty good. We'll pop oh, yeah. this one. Oh, as you can see, they just filled that nice top full of honey. Yeah, like that broken went top. Mm -hmm. So they're doing good. And again, I can't tell you why some of these do good. After we're done extracting though, it'll probably average out about 28 pounds to the colony for a lot of the ones. Here's a, right here, this one, I put a box in between. They're starting to work it a little bit, it looks like. Just starting to, here's the one that they fill. Oh yeah, I got some nice white right here. Some of these boxes, these are some older queens. These are second year queens right here. These probably will get, uh, when they're out in melons and they're around all the other bees with plenty of drone force, I'll probably <laughs> drop a cell in these and requeen these. I'll probably requeen for another week or so when these go in. I'll pull the honey, drop a cell in. We'll have a fresh new queen for next year because I'm only averaging about, well, two to one years per queen. When you go, when you do pollination, it really takes a toll on bees and those queens. They just seem to fizzle out really quick versus if you have them in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you account for keeping the queen? Because I saw the queen is still like laying brood up in some of these sewers. Mm -hmm. You just kind of just leave that for them for the winter and whatnot? So or? what I will do is um, I put, the flow was pretty good for a little bit and I put some extra boxes on. Um, if I didn't do that, which I am I wish I didn't, you know, I wish I did. What I'm going for is they plug them out, okay. but uh, the flow kind of shut off. Another mm -hmm. weird Michigan year, you know, we had a good flow for a little bit, then it stopped. And now we're, well, it's doing good now on a warm day, but you know, some days there's nothing coming in. Mm -hmm. um, usually I would just let them plug that out. Okay. Or when I'm, when I'm uh, pulling honey, I'll set an excluder underneath. I'll shake this, I'll fume them down, put an excluder underneath that and just let it hatch and then pull it off later. Yeah. If okay. there's any honey, I'll extract it. If not, uh, if it's just a little teaspoon, I'll go set it off somewhere and uh, let them rob, let it, them out. rob it out. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So here is a, let's see. I know I have a Russian hive around here somewhere. Let's see. Oh yeah. So this is one of my Russian queens. I just requeened it a month ago or less. I don't know uh, how good the pattern is. The hive was getting a little weak. This one probably won't go to melons, but uh, I haven't looked at it in a little bit, so we'll see. This is one of my Russian queens I got from an awesome friend of mine. And he just breeds great queens. They're looking pretty good though, from up top. This is a true Russian queen right here. Oh, this, <laughs> this hive did not look like this a week ago. Yeah. As Ooh. you can see, Ooh. Yeah, they packed that out with honey. Oh, yeah. You're dripping on it. Yeah. <laughs> They'll fix it. So it looks like they're doing pretty good. I'm also a big fan of <laughs> comb rotation, where you rotate oh. comb. Yep. So this is a new frame that I bought this year. So they drew that out quite nicely. So you can see they packed this hive full of honey. 
another Russian trait is they'll pack the brood nest up before they pack their box out. But that's a trait that I would like to have in my operation since I'm staying up here in Michigan all year, trying to, except for maybe California. Let's see if I can find, look at that. This is one of my Russian queens. That is beautiful. Austin, his name is Austin Smith, who has this line of Russians. And I have to say, I am pretty, pretty impressed with them. Really good, really good queens. Yeah, and I like those, uh, those honey frames there. Yes, yes. And if you see, that's a, just a strong Russian trait. I mean, no other hive really has that except these Russians. Hmm. They just love the pack out frames look at that oh that's so beautiful so yeah that's a good hive yeah this is such an awesome queen i do like these russians do you find that they're more aggressive than others or are they <laughs> well no smoke <laughs> do, do i look like a... <laughs> no smoke right now and they're not doing i don't that's a misconception such a yeah. misconception about russians uh now i have heard their daughters can be a little feisty I haven't had that yet, so I don't know where they got their information from the people who say that too. Um, I'm quite pleased with them. I have, I also use a couple other queen breeders that, uh, they're pretty nice, you know, those queens, but I do really like these brushes. So judging from this brood nest, let's roll the bottom and see if it's improved since. Now about a month ago, it was barely a box of bees. Woo! I think this will be a good California oh, yeah. hive, or Cali watermelon hive, so. Good California. Yeah, good California. <laughs> so, if you look, they're just gobs at the bottom there, too. Yeah. Oh, and they're starting, wait. Oh, no, those are bees. I thought they were starting to plug the screen. <laughs> no, bees, and so. Yeah. Oh. Definitely. All right, so today's question is coming from Terry4943. Why are you overwintering in nukes and not double deep boxes? I would think the nukes would get cold during winter up there. I have a couple nukes that probably won't build up much by winter. If I don't use the queens for my 20 hives, I'll try double deep nukes for winter. I live in central Iowa. I insulate my hives in November until March. Thank you, Terry, for reaching out. Um, I first just want to kind of like preface with not every bee is made to overwinter in a five, five over five nuke. Um, Casey has been breeding this specific genetic line for the last four or five years um, to be able to do this because our main goal is to be able to have bees that can actually overwinter well in Michigan and not have to have a whole lot of resources. But one of the other reasons why we like doing this is we've found when you have your bees in a 10 over 10 um, or even just like a single, it's really hard for the bees to cross frames and find food. Um, it's actually a lot harder for them to go over than it is for them to go up. So when we have them in a five over five, it condenses the hive down so that they're able to just go right up. And then also if you have to put sugar on them, sometimes you'll see like you'll put sugar on the hive and say like the cluster is over in like the seventh frame and they've already used all that sugar up there, but they can't move over to get the rest of the sugar. They end up dying of isolation starvation. Um, so we found that overwintering in a five over five really helps with that so that they're able to access all of their resources well. Um, but like I said, not every genetic of bee is made to do it. Um, I've overwintered some bees in five over five before and they've died and then other ones have survived. Um, so it just kind of depends on how many resources they use um, and how big their cluster is as well so they're able to keep warm. And I do just want to add that bees perform better in a smaller space. So another thing that I've noticed is when they overwinter in a smaller space like that, the moment that spring hits, they start building up and ramping up really fast, even faster than they do when I have them in a 10, um, a single or a double deep. So those smaller spaces really helps that spring build up um, and helps prepare them for the, the spring flow. So we get a better increase off of that. And I do just want to kind of clear up a little bit of some of the myths that I've heard around overwintering in five over fives. So I've heard some people say like, oh, they're gonna freeze to death. How are they gonna survive? How are they gonna keep warm? But as long as they have food, 
low mite numbers, and they have a really strong cluster, and it's big enough to be able to keep them warm and be able to rear brood and all of that, and they have healthy bees, then they're gonna do just fine. Now, in some of the colder parts of the world, yes, I would see that maybe it would be more difficult for you to overwinter in a five over five. Um, in fact, I see that Adrian Queenie, he does this method as well, and he stacks all of his together so they can all share heat against the walls. So that is also something you can do if you're a little bit worried about there not being um, enough insulation for them to be able to keep warm. But yeah, this is one of the experiments that Casey's been doing for a long time. He started doing it his second year of beekeeping. And um, his whole goal with it is, like I said, to be able to find a bee that was able to do it. So he started off with overwintering three queens in five over fives. And then the next following winter, he bred off of the survivors and he kept doing that until we have Viplidu now today. We overwintered her in a five over five last year and she did phenomenal. She ended up going into a seven over seven and then a 10 over 10 and then a triple deep for the summer, um, which we're gonna be condensing her back down into a five over five. But thank you for watching. The rest of the video with Caleb and Ron is coming very, very soon. So don't quit and be fit.